Thank you, Alyssa, for that very kind introduction. I'm very honored to be here talking to you today. Uh, I changed my title a little bit because I, I couldn't speak about all the things in the title in the, uh, the program. And just to let go, uh, signal ahead that this area is evolving very quickly and it's, in, and it's important to understand where the, the, the promise and tensions lie as you read and try to incorporate some of this thought into some of your work. So I don't have much to disclose, uh, just a little bit of a roadmap. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the premise of geroscience and it intersects with some of the talks yesterday on the measuring of biologic age as a tool in geroscience. I've been involved in trying to design many clinical trials to test a geroscience hypothesis and talk a little bit about that process. And finally, to just caution that we're in early days, it's, uh, um, I had, uh, uh, my, my father was a biochemist involved in lipid biochemistry and cholesterol metabolism. And I got to observe as a child, the whole arc of the lipid hypothesis uh, as a child over the dinner table. And I would say we're about where the, the, the lipid world is in about 1968. <laughs> so it's gonna be a while, I think, before uh, uh, everything is settled and, and, we, and we have the right end of the stick. So uh, this slide is courtesy of Steve Ostad. If you don't know, ever get a chance, uh, you should always take a chance to hear Steve talk, I guess is what I say. He's just a, a wonderful, very thoughtful speaker on the area of gerontology and, and the biology of aging. And if you look at the risk a person might be exposed to by these health habits going from age 40 to 65, they have hypertension that's untreated. They have a very high risk of uh, uh, increase, percent increase of uh, risk of uh, getting disease, smoking, cholesterol, diabetes. And we would like them not to get cardiovascular disease. So we would like to control these risk factors, which really is a, a major driving uh, strategy in controlling age-related disease which is, uh, okay, hypertension is the pathway, let's target hypertension. Cholesterol is a pathway, let's target that. So we're targeting individual risk factors, one disease at a time. But if you look at this uh, slide and look at now add age as a risk factor to all of this, the, the increase in cardiovascular risk associated with age dwarfs by many orders of magnitude any other risk factor. Now, when I was in graduate school, we just adjusted away for age because no one thought at the time you could do anything about it. And that the idea of geroscience is, well, maybe we can do something about it. But the problem is not just age-related disease, it's age-related physiologic changes. Uh, the, this graph uh, is from the, a monograph from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging. And you can see uh, some of these uh, aspects of health like basal metabolic rate, maximal heart rate, resting cardiac output. And if you look at uh, the upper uh, left, you see where people are when they're young, they have 100% of that capacity. And you can see there's this tendency as people age to lose uh, certain aspects of, of physical uh, capacity in a very reliable uh, and a, in a, a very uh, predictable way. Now, it should be noted that these are averages and we know that some people hold on to this function much longer and better than others. Uh, but on, on average, this is what happens. And this leads to uh, one of the goals that we have in aging research. So this is sort of a, a very simplistic model. You have some function like VO2 max, uh, uh, peak exercise capacity, and it goes down with age. And at some point you start to notice it and you can't do the things that you used to be able to do. We call that limitation. At some point, it, if it continues to decline, it gets beyond the point where you could, can do certain things without help and we call that disability. And certainly for VO2 max, if it goes to zero, that's certainly not compatible with life. 
So what are the, what are the gerontologic strategies that we have available to us? Well, the first one is to build reserve. So if we can push that whole line higher, then we delay the time until a person experiences either limitation, disability, or death. Now, this is a life course issue. Reserve starts in utero. We know from some of the, the studies done in England that large babies become adults with greater grip strength. And we know from other studies that midlife grip strength uh, predicts the dis disability and death in older ages. So as a population uh, a strategy to preserve function, um, it's never too early to start. So anti-poverty programs will ultimately in many years lead to the prevention of disability. And adding reserve is also life course dependent. A very important uh, study in our field uh, by uh, uh, Maria Fiatarone uh, showed that even people in their 90s can get stronger and, and people can be weight trained and, and get stronger and it does improve their, their physical capacity and, and reduces limitation. Other things are much harder. Bone strength is something, uh, bone accretion or bone density is really uh, the opportunity window is mostly in late adolescence. Uh, some drugs uh, can give a little bump to that, but uh, that's really an opportunity uh, for prevention. So where, what you're trying to prevent and what you're trying to, to interact with it really is dependent on the specific physiology that you're working with. So it would be great if we could slow decline instead. So uh, people start at the same point and we could slow that rate of decline and we get the same delaying of limitation and disability by slowing the rate of aging. It's been hard to see how to do that. Even master trained athletes have come into old age with more muscle mass, more muscle strength, more cardiovascular fitness, but they tend to lose it at the same rate as people who aren't exercising all the time. So reserve is something you can, you, you can bring. It's been harder to figure out how to slow the rate of aging, which brings us to geroscience premise. So geroscience is based on observations in, in animals showing that through a variety of different interventions, there are uh, ones that are dietary, there are ones that are genetic, there are man man manipulations that are the provision of small molecules can delay, uh, uh, extend lifespan and delay, uh, extend health span in an many animal models. And you've seen this in a different form by the speakers yesterday, these so-called hall hallmarks of aging. Well, uh, this are, these are the hallmarks of aging with specific uh, uh, ways of intervening on those hallmarks glossed onto them. And some are more developed than others. I'd say uh, the thing uh, that I'm involved in, I'll tell you a little bit in a bit, are senotherapeutics which we are clearing senescent cells, but there are many other opportunities. Uh, how do we know any of these might, uh, uh, that if we have a, have a pharmaceutical intervention, it might work? Well, we get some from the animal uh, literature. This is a, a slide from the interventions testing program. This is uh, sponsored by the Division of Aging Biology. People nominate compounds to test in a very rigorous way in very large mouse experiments, uh, both males and females at three different labs uh, as a way of assuring reproducibility and the rigor. Uh, these strain, they, they tested in a, a quadruple bred a sort of uh, genetically heterogeneous, so it's not strain dependent necessarily uh, what their findings are. And these are <clears throat> some of the early uh, compounds that have shown some benefit for extending lifespan in, only, in either male or female mice. Uh, each dot on, this, on these uh, survival curves is a dead mouse. So as mice die, the line goes down and you add a dot. And the endpoints of these studies are the 90th percentile of survival. And 
uh, in this in this uh, the testing program, um, it's been easier to extend life in male mice than female mice, but rapamycin, which you might heard about yesterday, uh, and high doses is an immune suppressant, uh, seems to be effective in both male and female mice. So this provides sort of the preliminary data, uh, some, uh, some guidance that this might be helpful in humans, but it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. There are things that look very promising that don't work in this model. I'll talk, tell you about metformin in a bit, but this is sort of the, the raw materials uh, for, for our belief and understanding that we can affect the aging process um, in a pharmacologic way. So how do we um, translate this to humans? Well, the first thing, if we want, we can't do these studies in humans. I mean, we could, but we couldn't afford it. It's infeasible. So the, a typical mouse study uh, starts uh, giving mice an intervention either at uh, four months of age or a year of age, and they keep following the mice until 90% are dead. We tried to do that in humans. We would be enrolling humans who are about 40 years old and following them to 80. And you have to be pretty, uh, pretty wealthy. I guess Jeff Bezos could do this. You could be, have to do pretty wealthy to, to do this study. So as you heard from uh, Dr. Belsky, we really do need ways to measure an aging process in a compressed way so we know if we're affecting it through our interventions. And so this is not only important for geroscience studies, this is important for a lot of people. And so I uh, put this cartoon together and you have a person in the past and they have environments that they're exposed to, physical, the healthcare, social, economic, interpersonal environments. They have a set of behaviors that are informed by a variety of, of, of features. And then um, because of the environments that they're in and the exposures that they experience, they have one of many possible health futures. So they could be the green or the yellow or any of a variety. Now, once they get to the yellow one, uh, these are older people that I, that, that I tend to work with. Um, they also have a futures, but they have far, few, far fewer available futures. The possible health states in five years for someone who's 75 is much more constrained than the possible health states of someone at 35 or 20 or five. So what do we want to want from measures of biologic aging? So we can know this person is age 70 or 75 and we can count the diseases that they have, but we would certainly like to have some kind of measure that helps understand the cumulative impact of past exposures and, uh, and ones that are independent of individual diseases would be nice. It also helps us understand the range of possible attainable futures in the, uh, that, that uh, we might uh, hope for uh, during interventions. We found that biologic age potentially moderates risk factor and age-related disease relationships. And we've seen this with age for some time, where for example, uh, high cholesterol in a person who's 50 is, is bad for them, but high cholesterol in someone who's 85 is actually a good prognostic sign and low cholesterol looks very dangerous in a person who's older. We see the same thing, but not uh, with hypertension. People are interested in biologic age as a potential proxy or indicator for, of resilience to diseases or their treatment. And we sure did see this in COVID where people with a lot of accumulated deficits uh, uh, at any age, we're at much higher risk of mortality. But we also see in some other studies that the benefit of interventions might depend on how, how, uh, how, old, how physically old you uh, were when you adopted the intervention. Um, we have been approached uh, over the years by financial planners. Uh, they're interested in knowing <laughs> how much life is left. Uh, and finally, uh, for the ger relevant to geroscience, we need a way to select interventions uh, to, that target aging biology, and we need 
uh, some measure of biology of aging to test the efficacy of uh, interventions targeting aging biology. So uh, we've seen a lot of these already. Uh, Dr. Belsky talked about a one measure which fall in a class, what I call age normalized physiologic assessments. Uh, his is an advance over some, many use something like NHANES and say, okay, a 30 year old has a HDL of X, you have an HDL of Y, and that looks more like a 38 year old. So at least for HD, your HDL age is eight years advanced. Uh, this is looking at trajectories uh, of people in the Dunedin relative to the mean trajectory as a way of calculating uh, a pace of aging that seems to be faster. Uh, you heard about methylation age from Dr. Horvath. Uh, we have been interested in accumulated deficits, sort of the number of hits that you may have accumulated over time. Uh, because if you think about aging, uh, uh, everyone has their own favorite definition of what aging is. Uh, I, at least one way to think about it is that the forces of degeneration are outstripping the forces of regeneration. And if that is a way to think about it, then you will be over time develop accu and accumulate a variety of signs that that is in fact true. And if you sum across a lot of potential organ systems, you might get some idea of how quickly someone is aging because it turns out that different organ systems may age at different rates. There's a lot of interest now in proteomic clocks. The grim age is in part tuned to proteomic, uh, pro pro the proteome associated with aging and mortality. Uh, the methylation age by Levine is, is uh, tuned to a physiologic, uh, age normalized physiologic uh, uh, vector. Uh, I'm part, uh, Wake Forest and, and I am part of something called the Predictive Biomarkers Network. These are a series of uh, UO1s awarded to try to pursue new um, measures of biologic aging. And I'm just uh, sharing a few of these so you know where uh, the attention is. Uh, folks at Buck are, are looking at uh, the proteome to look at senescence biomarkers. Uh, there's looking at the blood virome as uh, inflammation and chronic disease uh, driver of inflammation. Uh, nuclear morphology. This is a, a technique actually looking at molecular imaging and the nucleus itself changes its look as people age. Um, Steve Horvath is one of the centers, and we're looking at transcriptomics uh, associated with aging uh, and multimorbidity and mitochondrial function. So um, we're planning as part of a network, the Research Center's collaborative network, we put on workshops that are meant to cross cut at least four of the six NIA centers programs. So there's Peppers and Shocks and Rick Mars, and, and I, I won't go into the details. The, our next one, which is in January, is on biologic age measurement. We had a very good uh, uh, organizing committee, and the discussion I thought was very interesting about certain conceptual issues that came up in that discussion and certain empirical questions. Uh, a conceptual question is, when does aging begin? It certainly doesn't begin at 70. It's, probably, it, it's certainly a life, it's an unfolding across the whole life course. So it's hard to know, you, it doesn't really begin or end, it's just part of living, I think. Do tissues age independently? We like to think, or it would be, ha it would be very convenient, I guess I would say, if there was some master aging clock and that it's ticking away and everything is uh, deteriorating according to that underlying clock. There's certainly humoral, humoral factors, circulating blood factors that are driving some of this. The, the parabiosis experiments may, are pretty clear. There's something in young blood that's good for old animals and there's something in old blood that's not so good for young animals. So there are these factors, but in, when you're looking at trajectories of biomarkers tied to different organ systems, their change through time isn't particularly well correlated. So, so it's probably true that every tissue ages at somewhat of, of its own pace. So a lot of these aging measures of biologic age are normalized to some population. So who defines that? What is that? So right now the best uh, people are pointing to NHANES 
but it's a little constricting because the biomarkers available are the biomarkers that were of interest to the people who originally developed NHANES and don't reflect some more modern thinking. <clears throat> and probably very important, if we measure biologic age, we're measuring the sum cumulative uh, set of factors leading to your age at that day. And we don't know when that happened. Was it steady through that whole time course or did, were there periods of acceleration or periods of, of flattening? It's probably the latter. And we, what we really need is a measure that tells you the pace of aging right now. And Dan uh, did a good job in explaining their version of that, which is very promising. And then there are a series of empirical questions that came up. Are the things we can measure useful? So we can get blood very easily. Uh, we can get cells within the blood at, with some work and, and separate them with some work. Are these gonna end up being useful? That's an empirical question, don't know. We can get buccal swabs. We can look at cells in the cheek. Uh, we do a lot of work. Uh, we're doing a study right now where we're getting uh, bio muscle biopsies and fat biopsies on hundreds of people. Very expensive and very, very time consuming. Are, they, are these measures reliable? And there are two aspects of this. We heard about the technical reliability yesterday of some of the methylation measures. But there's also within person variability. If I measure you two days in a row, do I get the same answer? That's really important to know that for, for clinical trial design. Because if you're fluctuating tremendously on a measure, I need a lot more people or to measure each individual many, many times to, to dampen out that variability to see a signal. Are these measures sensitive to change? So if I did an intervention, would I know, would I see anything changing? And that just needs to be uh, understood. And are they scalable? Can you ramp this up and, and, and do this uh, in a feasible way in large populations? So as I said, we've been involved in trying to figure out how to design clinical trials. And I'll show you uh, the schematic of one that we've uh, we, we finished designing and hope to get started. But before I do that, um, just talking of now, reconnecting back to the geroscience idea. So this is what I just said. We have this FDA way of thinking. I'll explain why I call it the FDA way of thinking. So we delay a specific disease through controlling specific factors, and it's really good, but it's good for that one disease. But the geroscience thought is if we delay aging, we can delay multiple age-related diseases all at once. Um, uh, a, a group of us made a pilgrimage to the FDA about a trial that we were contemplating that involved the drug metformin. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And to see what, uh, what out, outcomes they would be interested in. And it's quite clear the FDA, well, the FDA said they, they, there's no indication for aging, that you cannot get a, uh, a pill uh, approved to delay aging. Uh, a statement in the room, though I wouldn't say it was FDA policy, is aging is a hypothetical uh, and sort of philosophical question. But if you could prevent disease, then we would be willing to listen to that. Or if you can prevent death, that's very important. And I'll, I'll link that up in a second. So this is a continuum of measurements that you could make in a geroscience guided trial. There are changes to individual molecules or cellular physiology. You could uh, slow uh, change biomarkers that are associated with it, mortality and disease, slow age-related physiologic degeneration, all the way to extend lifespan. The animal models mostly work at the extremes of this. They, it's easy, it's cheapest, I guess, to follow animals uh, to death without doing a lot of interrogation in between, but also getting samples to look at molecular and cellular physiologic changes. The uh, human uh, folks are most interested in the middle of this, and that's where we're exploring feasibility. But as you go through this continuum, uh, it takes longer, it's more expensive, it takes more people, but the salience is much higher. And so many people are suspicious of the, of the importance of biomarker changes in predicting future health. And so without a study that ties them all together, it's gonna to be hard to convince people, some people otherwise. 
So we got, uh, I got into this because our uh, center at Wake Forest has a long history of weight loss intervention trials in older adults. Uh, we've probably had 15 or 20 different intervention studies and have enrolled a couple thousand people over the years in weight loss studies. And if the thought was, well, the amount of caloric restriction we ask older people to do for a short period of time in these studies is really not that much different than some of the levels of CR that are done in animal models. And if we had a caloric restriction mimetic, maybe we could understand what we should measure if we looked at our weight loss participants. But the thought was uh, that that's really only a valuable exercise if caloric restriction actually affects all cause mortality in people. Because if it, it doesn't, then it's, it's a little bit uh, on shakier ground. So we did a meta-analysis. And these were all the studies at the time uh, that we could find that were randomized trials in which one group got caloric restriction and the other got, didn't. They could have gotten other things at the same time, but at least uh, yes, no caloric restriction and randomization, and they reported all-cause mortality. A lot of these studies are pretty small, very wide confidence intervals, but when you do the, the formal meta-analysis, overall there's an, a 15% reduction in all-cause mortality in the people randomized these trials over time. So we took this as uh, uh, some value in making ourselves uh, feel better about the, the, the process. Um, we've gone and I'll show you several, uh, a few studies that we've done. This is one that's coming out by uh, Jamie Justice, who's doing great work in this area. This is an ancillary study to a two by two trial of uh, caloric restriction and or exercise in uh, patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And uh, so uh, there, you can see 100 randomized to the study, 88 available for analysis. And uh, we used a biomarker index that we developed for another study called uh, the TAME study. Again, uh, I promise uh, I'll explain that in a bit. Uh, these are biomarkers that we went through a, a very careful process to select on several criteria. One is that it was related to outcome, age-related outcomes independent of age, that these were reliable measurements. They predicted many, out, many disease outcomes beyond uh, uh, only one. So they, they uh, and also predicted physical disability as well as a disease process. So these are, the, and, and they also had some evidence that they were changeable through intervention already in the literature. So we ended up with IL-6, TNF-alpha, receptor 1, GDF-15, cystatin-C, and NT-pro-BNP. And if you make an index of these, we found that uh, randomization to the caloric restriction part of this study uh, did in fact have a, a benefit uh, in lowering this index. Exercise did not in this study. Um, we work a lot, uh, the Coordinating Center for the Look Ahead Study is at Wake Forest, and uh, Mark Espeland, who's uh, been head of the Coordinating Center, has been working with our group to look at various age-related uh, measurements or out potential outcomes in that study. So this is over 5,000 people randomized either to a diabetes support group or a lifestyle intervention, which focused on weight loss and increase in exercise. Uh, and the groups lost 7% of their body weight on average in the first year, the intervention group, and, and maintained a, a separation, but everyone started gaining weight. And we looked at this frailty index as deficits uh, and to see if it would even respond to an intervention like this. And it responded quite, quite robustly, actually. And in the first year, a very big separation and drop in, cumul in, in the deficit index in the first year. Some other interesting things uh, in this study was the intervention was associated with longer uh, disability-free life expectancy, fewer hospitalizations, and lower healthcare costs. So that's all, all uh, coherent. I'm part of, uh, you heard about this, a translational geoscience network. Its purpose is to accelerate the field of geroscience by supporting phase one and two A trials, by providing design and uh, statistical advice, 
support for interacting with regulatory agencies, providing a standard uh, analysis platform through its facility for geoscience analysis. Uh, we are working to aggregate participant data from network studies to allow comparison across treatments and also working on a biobank uh, to, to uh, biobank pre and post treatment samples to help in evaluation. Uh, most of the activity right now is in the area of senolytics. So senescent cells, you may have heard of those as a cell fate. It's not cancer, it's not healthy, it's not dead. It's resist, these are cells that are resistant to apoptosis. And depending on how they become senescent, they can also secrete uh, something called the secretory, uh, senescence associated secretory phenotype, which has a lot of those biomarkers in them. IL-6 notably is very common in them. Um, they can uh, af affect the cells around them so that they can turn cells next to them, also senescence. And if you clear them from old mice, they show a remarkable revivification. Uh, the interventions that are available right now are a combination called desatinib and quercetin. One's a, actually an anti cancer drug that's used uh, in leukemia, I believe. The other quercetin is a, a polyphenol that's found in food. Uh, we have done uh, the first in, in human study of this in people with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, very short, it was proved that it was safe to provide, saw some improvements in physical activity, but uh, it was a very small study, only 14 people. So we felt good about the safety of it, but, uh, and got a little bit of signal for improvement in, in physical function, uh, and are now moving on to design a, a bigger study, uh, a more definitive one. The other compound is something called facetin, and there are several studies exploring this in the context of frailty and COVID long hauler syndrome and, and many other uh, aspects of it. I'm very interested in metformin as a safe, a safe drug that we know a lot about that's pretty cheap, but has shown it both in trials and epidemiology a remarkable range of potential benefits. This is like from the, the very first, uh, one of the first indications, it's a long-term follow-up of a study called the UK PDS. I'll just direct your attention to the book lower right. And it just shows death from any cause of people randomized to metformin very, uh, compared to a lifestyle control, uh, active control arm, showed a remarkable reduction in all cause mortality for a long uh, for uh, over quite a number of years. There's some evidence that this is good against uh, protective against neurodegeneration, a lot for cardio, cardiometabolic disease some evidence that's good for cancer and a variety of other things keep popping up in the literature. So uh, we worked with a team to design a trial to test whether giving metformin to non-diabetic older persons would uh, slow aging as reflected by the time to incidence to a, a composite endpoint, including MI, stroke, heart failure, many kinds of cancer, MCI dementia, or death. And this outcome was decided after we talked to the FDA about this study, because they weren't interested in what they call biochemical outcomes, like glucose or any biomarker. They would only uh, consider uh, seriously one that had clinical events. Now, if you're a gerontologist, you're actually less worried about that and more interested in mobility and cognitive function. So that's a secondary uh, outcome, and we would have a biobank to look at uh, both um, some pre-specified biomarkers, but also new biomarkers. Importantly, the entry criteria is slow gait, and we find that slow gait in older adults really is a good job of predicting bad things in the future of that person, uh, uh, both in terms of disability, but also in, in incident disease. So, the uh, tensions that we experience in trying to design studies inspired by geroscience are listed on here. What is the outcome? And really the answer to that is who is the audience? <laughs> if it's uh, FDA or 
uh, you know, uh, uh, audiences that are very interested in clinical outcomes, uh, then some combination of clinical events, incident clinical events, appears to be appropriate. Uh, if it's a gero, gerontologic one, it's much more focused on function of various kinds. And which outcome you pick also has to do with time to event, uh, time to benefit. If you look at weight loss studies, uh, and in particular, like the Swedish obesity study, uh, which was not a trial, but showed that uh, people with obesity who got stomach uh, revisions to, to uh, lengthen their lifespan, I mean, to, to control their obesity, they showed a mortality advantage, but you didn't see that separate for a number of years. Uh, it looks like I'm getting the sign. So you can see, we can talk about some of these others maybe in the questions. And just, very, just to wrap up, uh, it's early days in this field, Ex expect fits and starts. It's not gonna be a smooth uh, uh, liftoff. Expect the benefits to be more modest than pro uh, more modest than promised. There's a huge industry um, purporting incredible benefits for this, and this biases everyone's expectations. And the animal models are also probably optimistic. Expect the field to someone to get something to work, and then the field coalesce around that. But we're still in a in a dispersive phase where people are trying a lot of different things. We don't know what's going to work yet. And we certainly need large trials that link biomarkers to the physiology, to functional outcomes, so that we don't have to do the clinical outcome study every time we're trying to evaluate this. So these are all the folks that I work with on the various uh, networks that I'm involved in. And I'll leave you with this. Uh, I always miss, if you haven't seen this before, uh, there's a, this is a, a, a Swiss uh, uh, artist who thinks that Art's too messy, so he tidies it up. That's on the bottom. And I often think that I am uh, studying that last, that bottom red dot. And a lot of us are studying one little piece of a big picture. And we got to remember that uh, from time to time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. That was an amazing overview and in depth. So we're gonna bring in Liz Nielsen to be our discussant. Welcome, Liz. Thanks, Alyssa. Can you all hear me okay? The awkward okay. Zoom transition. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if you guys can hear me. Somebody let me know and then I'll, I'll start talking. We, we hear you. It's great to hear your voice. Okay, wonderful. I'll just get started. So thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to share this uh, time with you and really nice talk. Um, I was just going to say a few perspectives on uh, the geroscience approach and some of the things Steve shared with us from a behavioral and social science framework. So Steve shared a framework for thinking about anti-aging interventions and raised a number of questions that can inform how the social and behavioral sciences could contribute to advancing an equitable geroscience agenda, which is going to be the focus of my remarks. So geroscience interventions can slow decline or they can build reserve. And both of these are ways of compressing morbidity and increasing health span. That is the amount of lifetime uh, life that you lose. And arguably this is the outcome of an equitable geroscience we would be seeking, not necessarily extended lifespan, but more years and better health for all. Uh, Steve also asks, when do you start and who do we treat? And should this be driven by when we understand that aging begins, which is a question that's increasingly getting a lot of attention from my colleagues in aging biology. Um, there's a lot of suggestion that we've heard throughout the conference that interventions may need to occur in earlier life phases when declines in system integrity may still be reversible or can be compensated for when it's possible to build resilience or sustain resilience and slow the pace of aging. One of the things though that Steve doesn't ask us, though he acknowledges their importance, is what exposures predict aging and when do they need to be measured? And can this inform the question of when interventions ought to start? And I think this is one of several places where behavioral and social science studies offer insight. So for example, some deeply phenotyped longitudinal studies with rich assessments of stress and environmental exposures alongside biomeasures and functional and health outcomes 
can help us to answer questions about the timing of when exposures matter and how dysregulation manifests. So for example, uh, Jeff Simpson has done some elegant work in the Minnesota study of risk and adaptation to compare different models of when stress exposures matter to drive physiological change. He compares the cumulative stress model, which looks at total life exposure to stress, the biological embedding model, which assumes that exposures in sensitive periods early in life matter most, and the sensitization model, which it suggests it's this interaction of early exposures and later exposures. And in his study, uh, he was looking at the HPA axis, and he found that there was flatter diurnal cortisol in those with high early life adversity and high current stress, suggesting a kind of a vulnerability phenotype for accelerated physiological dysregulation and supporting this kind of sensitization model. And the point of this example being that the dysregulation that becomes apparent later in life, in order to understand it, we may need to understand exposures that happened at much earlier phases. Not just asking the question, when does aging begin, but when are the exposures that drive aging uh, active? I think the behavioral and social sciences can also contribute to strengthening connections between geroscience studies and social and behavioral investigations by bringing our frameworks, our theoretical frameworks and models into closer alignment. Uh, there's a nice examples that we've seen from the Dunedin study, but there's also a really interesting uh, recent paper by Waylon Hastings, Dave Almeida and Idan Shalev uh, in the Journal of Gerontology that used MIDAS data to compare biologic aging measures uh, and like homeostatic dysregulation and allostatic load measures uh, that are developed in different research silos. Uh, this paper addressed both the commonalities between these measures as well as their differences and demonstrated the utility of combining the best of them. Uh, the authors of this paper emphasized that while these measures have conceptual similarities, the biological aging measures like homeostatic dysregulation are designed as surrogate endpoints where the allostatic load measures are theoretically motivated as measures of cumulative physiological dysregula dysregulation resulting from adaptation to environmental challenge. In other words, the exposome is baked into the all allostatic load theoretical model, including what Eileen Crimmins has called the social hallmarks of aging, like low socioeconomic status, minoritized status, adverse life experiences, poor mental health and unhealthy behaviors. I think more work that is done to draw these parallels and explore complementarity of geroscience and social science measures and theoretical framework can help to continue to break down these existing silos and hopefully um, lead to the development of more holistic frameworks for thinking about aging. This may involve behavioral and social studies adopting some of the new exciting biomeasures that we've been hearing about over the past couple of days but full incorporation of social hallmarks into geroscience studies in diverse populations and across the life course should also be a goal. And I think our fields have strong theoretical bases to inform which exposome measures are likely to identify who is at risk of accelerated aging. And we can also offer some insights into how we may need to think about designing and delivering interventions for maximal impact based on social conditions and also behavioral phenotypes. And I, I wanted to point out that our Division of Behavioral and Social Research at NIA is poised to support this work. I have a few pieces of good news. One is that based on conversations with many of you here and others in the field, we've recently gotten approval for a concept to support a network to bring together many of our deeply phenotyped longitudinal studies to, among other things, test geroscience hypotheses uh, about the role of social hallmarks in aging trajectories. We're also looking to hire a new uh, program officer in psychobiology and the developmental origins of health and disease who can contribute to uh, growing our science in this area. So if you're interested in joining our team, I really hope that you will reach out to us about that. Um, and then just in closing, I wanted to draw a little contrast between some things that we've heard over the past couple of days. Um, we heard about this new high-tech world, the fully measurable individualized exposome. And I think we can contrast this with Julian Thayer's poignant recollection of his days sitting in the segregated section of the movie theater and of his father's occupational stress and accelerated aging and reminder to us that this is not that long ago. Indeed, it's still with us. 
A recent National Academies report uh, documented the stark uh, differences in, in um, mortality rates among, well, not differences, sorry. They it highlighted the increasing midlife mortality that's affecting all groups in our country, um, driven by factors that drive accelerated aging, like mental distress and a heightened cardiovascular risk. This is driving increases in working age mortality, that's ages 25 to 64 in all groups in our society, but it's especially high in black men. And these are rates that are unprecedented in comparable societies in the 21st century. And it reminds us that not everybody gets to live to age 50. So more research is really needed to get at the causal drivers of these trends and develop approaches to ameliorate them. And I think that our uh, social and behavioral frameworks uh, and within a health equity framework have a role to play in driving that agenda. Because as Michael Marmot so pointedly uh, has said, what good is it to treat people and then send them back to the conditions that made them sick? Thank you. So hopefully there are questions for Steve uh, that you all will, um, but I think that this is it's an interesting opportunity to think about uh, how to pull these frameworks together and what, uh, what the, the geriatrics, geroscience view can benefit from, from combining with some of the models that we have in our fields. Yes, wonderful points, Liz. And the, you can't see, but the audience was wrapped. <laughs> Thanks, uh, David Cresswell, Carnegie Mellon. Um, Liz, great, great presentation. I actually have a, a question for Steve, given that um, I know a lot of interest has been placed in caloric restriction coming out of the you know, particularly the rodent models on that. And um, some of it seems to be translating. You talked about the meta-analysis with humans. Um, I guess I, I'm trying to figure out where you think caloric restriction is going as a, uh, you know, area of study and trying to reconcile that with, I think, you know, I've seen some, some meta-analyses on our best models of caloric restriction in humans, which is anorexia. And they actually show, you know, accelerated mortality. And so trying to kind of reconcile how you think about that. Sure. Um, I, I think there are many pathologic conditions that are reflected in very low body weight. There's cancer cachexia, there's cachexia of heart failure, anorexia is another disease where if you push someone into the extreme of their, physio their physiology, that takes a toll on people and that's going to uh, be predictably uh, bad for them. Uh, we're not talking about that at all. Uh, we're talking about people who are otherwise uh, normal weight or obese and asking them to get slightly, uh, lose a little bit of weight. So where we are in the distribution of a weight and body composition, just don't really have any, uh, they're, they're just sort of in, in just, polar extreme. So I, I don't expect the anorexia uh, issue to be um, that, uh, it, it's just a different process completely. Uh, where we're going with caloric restriction is, is trying to understand in humans what we think we understand in animals, which is what, uh, what of the biologic machinery that seems to be good for the biology of aging that caloric restriction causes can, do we see that in humans and can we see it in the same way? So are there straight caloric restrictions just asking people to eat less and that works for a while for people and some people are able to stay with it. Then there's time restricted eating, which is pushing it all in the window or alternate day fasting. And there are some theoretical reasons to think that those, or at least in the animals, that it turns on machinery that's good for repair and rejuvenation and you do that periodically and that's gonna be good for the life course. Is that true in humans? We're not sure. Uh, we're starting a, a three-year pilot for a five-year study to examine those questions right now. Okay, we have time for one more question and then we have a five minute break before the next session. Sorry, Martin, but Steve will be around. Thank you. Right. Okay, Steve. Um, 
I'm wondering, <clears throat> I didn't hear much about um, prevention of depression in the right. studies that you were talking about. Right. And since depression is such a huge contributor to disability, I just wondered if you could comment on that. Depression is missing in action in so much of geroscience and in medical gerontology completely. And I don't get it <laughs> because, uh, oh, oh, I thought I'd fall, fall off the stage there. If you, um, uh, in our epidemiologic studies in health ABC, if you wanna know what's gonna predict both physical and cognitive decline, it's depression as the antecedent. Right. Um, I've, in, in, uh, mood has been measured in some studies in older adults, and at least in the studies that uh, collected any information on it, you don't see a big effect on it. I don't think there was a big effect on depressive symptoms in the calorie study, but none of these studies are recruiting people with high depressive symptoms or, or very few people with high symptoms in the first place, so it's hard to know what to tell you. Right, and, and risk for depression is, is not necessarily depressed, you know, symptoms of depressed right. mood. Right. So there is a, you know, there's a literature on risk for depression that I think could benefit from more Absolutely. attention. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. sure you're right. I'm sure you're right. Okay, we'll return in five minutes for the meditation symposium.